Triune God, we give thanks for your mercy, grace, and steadfast love. We gather to worship you, to be encouraged for our journey of discipleship. Guide us by the power of your spirit to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, sharing love, mercy, grace with all we encounter. Ready us to give the reason for our hope, for our faith in Jesus Christ. May our time of worship, our prayers and our praises be pleasing to you, eternal God. Amen. Our hymn is number 466, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And please stand as you are able. There will be a little introduction there. And if you can't hear, please just like raise your hand and I'll turn the volume up. recognize that we have often fallen short of following in the path of discipleship, following in the path of grace and love, of forgiveness to others and to ourselves. To come before God with the truth of our lives is an act of faith. The Holy One is interested in each of us, in our hearts, our minds, our souls. So we trust that God's mercy and grace are intended for each one of us no matter how many times or in what ways we have fallen short of what God desires for us. In humility and faith and in trust, let us share the words of our prayer of confession. Let us make our confession to God. Merciful God, you walk with us even when we fail to see you. You call us even when we fail to hear. You listen for our petitions even when we fail to speak. You whisper words of love, even when we respond with indifference. You call us to repentance, even when we don't see the need. Forgive us, Holy One, heal our hardness of heart, that we may turn to you anew. Open our minds to your spirit, that we may hear your words, refresh our souls, that we may speak of your love. In the Redeemer's name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, hear us now as we each offer our own silent prayers of confession. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God is loving. Our God is a redeeming God. God's promise of redemption is for each one of us and for the healing of the world through the forgiveness of our sins. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Rejoice in the good news of God's grace. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Let us stand together for the Gloria Patri. Join me in the prayer for elimination. Send your spirit among us, O oh God. Prepare our minds to hear your word. Move our hearts to embrace what we hear and strengthen our will to follow your way. This we pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is Genesis 1, verses 27 through 31. Listen to God's word. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant in the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move among the ground, along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give you every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. For those disciples that were following Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, which happened during that Passover, appeared to be the end of the movement that Jesus had started. But then there was the resurrection. There was Jesus' appearance to the disciples and others during that 40-day time period after the resurrection. And during that time, Jesus had said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then also during the days following his resurrection, Jesus gave the following commission that we have recorded in Matthew to the disciples before he ascended into heaven. Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days after he rose from the grave. 10 days later, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples and the church. You will find a similar reading to this one from Matthew in, at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Here now, Matthew's words, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, the passage that we know familiar as the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted, and then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Not too long ago, I cleaned out the glove compartment in my car, and I disposed of several paper roadmaps. When was the last time you actually used a paper roadmap? Been there too? Anymore, we don't need roadmaps like we once did. With technology like Google and various forms of GPS, we can get directions quickly and easily from our computers, from our phones. Sometimes even our cars have that capability. When we use maps and now GPS and other technology to guide us, it's to show us the way, it's to help us avoid de detours. And most of us have had somebody or more than one person in our lives who's been a guide, a mentor, 
who's inspired and taught, who has sometimes disciplined us. It may have been grandparents, it may have been your parents, a teacher, a coach. Perhaps it was a business associate. Think for a minute about the people in your life who showed you the way, who offered direction and instruction, who guided you or attempted to guide you around pitfalls if you were following their counsel. That was the role Jesus had for his 12 disciples. From the day he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus had been teaching and guiding and preparing them for when he was no longer present with them. He was trying to give them a roadmap for what was ahead. Now we use the word disciple frequently, but do we really think about what the word disciple means? Disciple means learner, student, or follower. Perhaps you can consider a disciple like an intern who was watching and practicing under supervision, who's asking questions, occasionally making mistakes, but hopefully learning from those mistakes. The word disciple is used over 250 times in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And we can learn from the descriptions of Jesus' disciples in the New Testament that a disciple is someone who trusts Jesus so much that they pled, pledge their full allegiance or faith to him. A disciple is someone who imitates Jesus' life, both as their teacher and as their Lord. A disciple is someone who looks to Jesus' teachings as the basis of their moral decision-making. A disciple is someone who loves Jesus so much that that love spills over into every other relationship. A disciple is someone who shapes their life after that of Jesus Christ and his teachings. In Christianity, discipleship is the teaching, training, and developing of persons whose lives reflect these characteristics. <clears throat> we look back at Jesus and his disciples. They had been in a sort of internship for some three years. They had received guidance and instruction from Jesus. Perhaps we compare that time of them being with Jesus, like trying to learn to ride a bike with training wheels. They knew Jesus was close by, he was going to hang on to the back of the bike in case they got wobbly. He was going to try and keep them from falling, to help them get back up if they did fall, and to answer any of their questions and their concerns. And when Jesus summoned the twelve and told them he was sending them out two by two with instructions as what they should take with them and where they should go and where they should stay and how they should proclaim the gospel, and that they were going to be empowered to bring the gift of healing to those that needed it. This was kind of a, an, an initial trial training mission for those disciples. And later Jesus said to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This was Jesus' final instruction to the disciples. This was the roadmap for the ministry that lay before them. It was on Pentecost Day that the Lord poured out the Holy Spirit on the disciples. That was the day the training wheels came off, and the disciples were empowered to continue the mission Jesus had prepared them for, telling the mighty deeds of God. On that Pentecost Day, the bystanders asked what all this meant, the sound of the wind, the talking in different languages, and Peter responded by telling what God had done on our behalf through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter shared the good news that day. A disciple points people to Jesus, shares what they've experienced in their life that has made a difference in how they think about God, how we feel about ourselves, how we live, we can't help but share the good news because it is good news. It is things that have happened in our lives and things that can also affect the world. Each of us should ponder, am I a disciple of Jesus? This question calls for more deliberation than where is it I go to church or when did I get saved? A disciple 
is someone who is following Jesus, who is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And so whether or not you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, it has a strong implication for how you live, not just for a decision that was made or not made years ago. When the theologian Billy Sunday was converted and joined the church, a Christian man put his arm on the young man's shoulder and said to him, William, there are three simple rules I can give you, and if you hold on to them, you will never have to write backslider after your name. First, take 15 minutes each day to listen to God talking to you. Second, take 15 minutes each day to talk to God. And finally, take 15 minutes each day to talk to others about God. Jesus' great commission to the disciples is also a commission to each one of us. It is, in effect, a call for us to talk to others about God, to invite others to join us in Christian discipleship. This invitation to talk to others is sometimes called evangelism. And I know evangelism is a word that strikes fear in the hearts of many people. And there are plenty of negative connotations attached to evangelism. But we need to reclaim an understanding of evangelism as personal sharing between people, sharing in a conversation, friends talking with friends, co-workers sharing over lunch, parents with children, sharing what God means to you, what your relationship with Jesus Christ means to you. Conversation may start with someone asking, why do you attend church on Sunday when there are so many other things to do on Sunday morning? Or maybe with a child asking, why do we say a prayer before we eat? These why questions can open the door to share the gospel with each other. We want people to know why we, share, why we pray, why we share the gospel, why we participate in the life of a church, why the knowledge of God's sovereignty impacts how we live. Theologian D.T. Niles described evangelism as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. The heart of the gospel is the good news, the message that Jesus Christ died for the salvation of our souls. This should bring each of us hope. And we should always be ready to give a testimony of the reason for the hope that is within us, as First Peter says, and disciple others to walk in the way of Jesus Christ. Discipling others absolutely involves modeling our faith in our lives. It imparts the reasons, sharing the reasons for believing in and living for Jesus Christ. And the spirit or the manner in which we tell the good news to one another is important. It's important to back up that our, that our behavior back up what we say. Because those who are looking to the whys and hows of faith need to hear and to see what we believe the truth behind how we live. People who are looking to us as Christians to understand how and why, they need more than just a good example. Now you can't ever teach anyone all the hows, but when you share with them the whys, you can prepare them to exercise wisdom and maybe do their own searching. Telling what our faith means to us is an important part of evangelism. It is an important part of the Great Commission, but we always need to be sensitive to our audience. Have we been invited to tell our story or are we forcing ourselves on someone else against their wishes? The purpose of discipleship is to help believers become devoted followers of Jesus Christ. But none of us will be able to share the good news of the gospel if we don't feel that good news for ourselves. Don't be one of those Christians whose Christian life is all about grim duties and guilt feelings and a deadening of the spirit. When we fail to live out a lifestyle that reflects the spirit of Jesus Christ in our lives too, fails to reflect the joyfulness that we can feel because of our relationship with Christ, we don't, we don't do justice. Anyone can imitate Christianity for a while without any real conviction. But that kind of faith won't last and it won't save us. 
We often need to discover the gospel anew for ourselves, the good news for ourselves before we share with others. Throughout the gospel, throughout the Bible, there are many commissions, like the one that we heard from Genesis, go and be fruitful and multiply and care for the earth. Abraham called to go to a new land, Solomon to build a temple. God asks of us to participate in the life of the world in many different ways. Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And like on the day of Pentecost, that includes all men and women, young and old, people from every tribe and every nation. The Great Commission isn't to call people into church programs and church ministries, but to call people to experience the steadfast love of our faithful, trying God. Therefore, making disciples isn't just increasing church membership. And this is kind of difficult to wrap our minds around. If you make disciples, you always get the church. But if you seek to make a church, you rarely get disciples. This is a major shift from making church members or whatever we use to substitute for discipleship. Because if our goal is to set out to build the church, there's no guarantee that we're going to make disciples, true followers of Jesus Christ. It's likely that we'll create consumers who, dis who depend on spiritual services rather than who are devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And always being aware that even when our efforts draw visitors into our church, but if they experience something that is negative and unappealing, they'll not be convinced to give us a second try. So we can't make ourselves or anyone else a student or an intern of Jesus Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our faith community. Jesus' Great Commission wasn't just for those first 12 disciples in the first century. It is the commission to all of us who follow Jesus Christ, all of us who claim the name Christian. In Romans 10, verse 14, Paul asked, but how are they to call on one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone proclaiming him? So how can we follow Christ's call to action, the Great Commission in faithful and authentic ways? Tell the story of Jesus Christ and his love and tell how Jesus has made a difference in your life. Jesus reforms and transforms our lives. Second Corinthians 5 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So tell the good news joyfully, keeping in mind that before we can share the good news, we must be the good news. A Christian disciple is one who puts Jesus first, who obeys the Lord, who produces good fruit, who loves others so that others would know and worship our Lord and Savior. Following Jesus Christ means making disciples. This is a lifelong learning process as students of Christ. We don't become a Christian by making disciples, but once we are a disciple of Christ, we desire, few things come closer to capturing the heart of our calling than making disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are all to share the good news of God's salvation for all people. To paraphrase a line from that old TV show, Mission Impossible, that is our mission if we choose to accept it. May we boldly accept Christ's commission as disciples of Jesus Christ, as a faith community, and may we also step out in faith to answer the Great Commission. Alleluia. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together. Our hymn is, Lord, you give the Great Commission. It's number 429 in your hymn book. It'll be a little introduction. <laughs>
God's Spirit moves among us, making all things new. Let us participate in this new creation by offering the gifts we have to share with God. Freely we have received from God's hands, let us return to God what we can. Please leave your offerings in the box at the back of the sanctuary. Um, you can remain seated for the doxology or stand at your choice. Triune God, you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life to redeem the world. There has never been a greater gift. With thanks and praise for a debt we can never repay, we offer our gifts to your service to show your love and mercy to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, our Lord Jesus Christ invites us to the table that he has prepared for all who love and trust in him for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins and who desire to live in obedience and discipleship with Jesus Christ are invited to come with gladness to the table of our Lord. Let us join in singing our communion hymn. It's number 507, the verses 1 through 4. And we'll have a brief introduction. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth. You made us in your image and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his life death and resurrection opened the way of everlasting life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, Holy, 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 Hol
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Almighty God, how wonderful is the work of your hands. When sin had scarred the world, you entered into covenant to renew the whole creation. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, as a father joyfully welcomes his own, you embraced a people as your own. You filled them with a longing for a peace that would last, for a justice that would never fail. And through countless generations, your people have hungered for the bread of freedom. From them, you raised up Jesus Christ, your son, the living bread in whom all ancient hungers are satisfied. Jesus Christ healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, though death would hunt him down. But with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit for each one of us. And so gracious God, as we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we commemorate Jesus, your son. Death could not bind him. You raised him up in the spirit of holiness, exalted him as Lord of creation. And therefore we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed with this sacrament. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray. Creator God, be present with your life-giving word and Holy Spirit that we and your entire church may be called out and made whole through this supper. Grant that all who share in the communion of the body and blood of your Son may be united in him, and that we may remain faithful in love and hope until we feast joyfully with Christ at the coming of the kingdom. Together, let us pray for the world and for ourselves as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On a night when Jesus gathered with his friends, on the night before he gave himself up for us, Jesus was at a meal with those friends and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take this, all of you and eat it. And later, when the meal had ended, Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to the God of all creation. And he passed the cup among his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed by my blood, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will the elders come forward, please?
Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God. Friends, take, drink, and remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God. God. Let us join our voices in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. O oh God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, claimed us in baptism, and mercifully redeemed us on the cross. In this meal, we remember your love and mercy, and pray that through your grace, we may yield ourselves, our wills, our works, a continual thank offering to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together for our closing hymn. It's number 443. It'll be a little introduction. <laughs>
So receive the benediction. Go into the world and make disciples, knowing that the love of God, the grace of his son Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit are with you now and always. Alleluia. Amen. Go in peace. There are refreshments today. <laughs>